I like this song. The last, uh, the, the verse, uh, or rather the chorus, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. I want to thank Cody for leading the songs, going along with the theme that we're going to be starting for the next several weeks, at least the series that we're going to be going through. We're going to be looking at how could I teach Jesus? We're going to look at various different things. How could I teach Jesus to those that are religious? How could I teach Jesus to those who already knew him but fell away? How can I teach Jesus to those who don't believe in God? And so on and so forth. We're going to be looking at various different things because ultimately we are called to teach the gospel to every individual, right? And we don't always know every single time for every person we encounter, just like the way we talk about Wednesday night, what kind of soil we're going to be encountering. But we do know we just got to, we got to sow the seed. We got to be those who are preaching the gospel, right? We got to be those who are teaching people the very news in which saved us. You know, I was reading an article from September of 1985, and this article talked about a celebration of a New Orleans uh, a municipal pool. And it was celebrating. There was a celebration going on at this pool that was centered around the, the, it was the first summer in their memory as a pool without a drowning at this particular pool. Now, in honor of the occasion, 200 people gathered, including 100 certified lifeguards. As the party was breaking up and the four lifeguards that were on duty, they began to clear the pool. They noticed that there was a fully dressed body floating uh, in the deep end. See, they tried to get to the man. His name was Jeremy Moody. He was about age 31. They tried to get to him, but it was too late. He had drowned, surrounded by lifeguards, celebrating their successful season. I read that article, and it reminded me about how Christianity is a celebration, is it not? Christianity truly is a celebration of the life that we now have in Jesus. I mean, constantly, how many times do we find words like joy in the New Testament? I mean, uh, 15 times just within the book of Philippians, we find that word joy. We find victory constantly throughout the New Testament. Christianity is a, celebra uh, is a celebration, but can we celebrate while at the same time neglect people that are lost? You get what I'm saying? Can we just focus on, I'm so glad I'm saved, meanwhile neglecting people that are in need of the same thing. I'm so glad that I have Jesus, and this is just a me and God thing. Meanwhile, there are people that are in need of that same celebration. Man, we want the whole world to experience victory. Amen? We want the whole world to experience joy. See, Christianity is that only life that provides that. And there might be people, here's the thing, just like the way in that story we had this individual who drowned amongst people who knew how to save him, there might be people in our lives who are drowning in sin, lost, maybe at work, maybe at home, maybe within our congregation. That means we've got to be looking, right? That means we've got to be earnestly searching and seeking how we can also bring people in to join in in that celebration before it's too late. Now, as we look at this, as we look at this series, and as we break down several things, this question that we're going to ask before we look at, you know, ways that we could teach different people or ways that we could talk about this and even overcoming maybe some things such as fear of not knowing everything, maybe fear of, of, of encountering people for the first time with this. We're going to talk about those things in another series, but ultimately this first, uh, this first sermon is going to deal with why should I talk about Jesus? Why should we talk about Jesus? Let me tell you something. Yesterday, I mentioned it uh, yesterday after at, when we were eating pizza together let me just say how encouraged i am by this congregation not only by those that went out and went door knocking with us but even those who prayed i got text messages from people saying you know i wasn't able to make it but let me let you know i'm praying for you guys out there today people ask me how did it go even today i had people saying man i wish i could have been there i'm so glad i know there were people even prior to that praying this congregation loves lost souls isn't that awesome and yet this series that I'm doing is not just to continue to encourage us to have that mindset, but even to look at not just on a congregational level, but individually in my own life. How could I be reaching the souls that I know within my group of friends, within my own family, within my co maybe my work group or my study group or whatever? We're going to look at several passages tonight to help us understand this. But for one, in our first point, why should we talk about Jesus? Because without him, we would be lost. Why should we talk about Jesus? Because with him, we are saved. Amen? Praise God because of his salvation. If you're like me, I need to be reminded of this often because I forget, I forget this. And to forget is to fail to live the way Christ intended for me to live. 
Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Uh, we looked at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 through 25 in our Sunday morning sermon as we talked about coming together and assembling together. And the very first verse that we looked at was verse 23. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, the Hebrews writer says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, the confession of the faith or the confession of hope, as some translations put it. He says, not waveringly, knowing that the one who promised that hope is faithful. That's the reason why the Hebrews writer was writing to the church, or excuse me, the early church in the first century. Uh, that's the reason why he was writing that letter, that book, the book of Hebrews, reminding them, man, you've got something better. You've got something greater. You've experienced something that nothing else in this world could even come close to. Don't lose hope. And don't lose sight of professing, confessing that faith. Don't lose sight of what you said that you were going to engage in, and that is a life as a servant of God. And one of those things is evangelizing, right? One of those things is teaching others about the gospel. I think about God's plan overall to redeem man. We see that it was always God's intended plan to save man, right? Man fell in the garden. But you look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God tells, as we look at what Moses records in Genesis 3, God says that he had a plan. You jump to generations later to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 5, and you still see that God had a plan. And thanks be to God that you and I as a church today are living proof of that plan. So we need to be talking about it. We need to be sharing it with other people that may not fully understand that idea. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, an angel told Joseph that he was to call his name Jesus. Why? Because he was going to save his people. That's what the name Jesus means, Yeshua or Jesus in the Greek. It means Jehovah saves, salvation. But save his people, save us from what? Save us from sin, why? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 helps us understand that. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every single person who has ever existed, except for Jesus himself, has dealt with and has struggled with the burden of of sin and has engaged in sin. And in, ver in chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is this it's death. That means eternal separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But then, how can we obtain that very thing? You and I are living proof that there is hope. You and I, as a church, are living proof that there is a God in heaven who has loved humanity long before humanity came into existence. But how can humanity be saved? Hebrews chapter 9, the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or there is no forgiveness of sins. So what does that imply had to be done? Someone had to shed blood, right? And the prophets deal extensively with talking about who that someone is. This morning we quoted from Isaiah 53 uh, in verse 5 that by his stripes we are healed. Whose stripes? The one who would save his people. Yeshua. Jesus. And by his stripes, by his blood that was shed, we're healed. We looked at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 this morning in which Paul says that we have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Do we believe that as Christians? I mean, we're living proof of that, right? You and I are living proof of those who have been cleansed and washed by his blood. We're those who are purchased, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, by his blood. Jesus had to shed blood so that you could have life in him. And if you're a Christian, remember how we ta talked about partaking of these emblems, right? We talked about how when we partake of these emblems, we should remember that, what he's done for us. We should remember that death, that burial, the resurrection, how he did so in glory and in power, how his strength and his glory saved us and delivered us from darkness. How then could we not share this with people around us? I think to Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 to 38. You got Peter preaching the first gospel sermon since Jesus had ascended to heaven. And he's preaching the good news. He's preaching the death, the burial, the resurrection to a huge crowd of individuals, right? 3,000 souls that day obeyed the gospel. What did they hear? They heard the same thing that you and I obeyed. What did they obey? That very same thing. We read in verse 42 that they were those who believed and they were baptized, about 3,000 of them that were added to the church according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. If you have your Bibles, I want us to read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 through verse 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 9. 
And Paul is writing this book. I mean, the first few chapters of the book of Ephesians deals with the glorious gospel. How beautiful it is how God orchestrated everything long before the foundation of the world in order to establish his kingdom, that is the church. We're going to go ahead and read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. And this is something I have to, I read every now and then to remind me of where I once was and where I am now. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. I want to go ahead and stop right there as we look at that passage in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 through 9. Uh, this passage reminds us of where we once were, right? It reminds us of how precious and how beautiful the gospel is. And because of what he's done, we have a new life. We have something far greater than anything else in the entire world. We have salvation. Do you and I truly believe that? Because if we did, wouldn't we want to share that with more people? Wouldn't we want the people that we know that are lost in our lives to take part in that very same thing? Or is it just something, well, that works for me. No, according to the passage that we read, that is the only thing that works for all humanity. It's the only thing that truly can cure the sin sickness that this world has had since its fall. But thanks be to God that there are individuals. That's why the church exists. I mean, think about this. you got these group of individuals in multiple communities all throughout the world who know the truth, who know the gospel. That's awesome. But are those people who have obeyed the gospel and themselves redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, are they sharing that beautiful story with others? Are they telling people, man, i got to tell you what happened to me i got to tell you what happened in my life. i got to tell you what's so great in my life. And it's not because of me, but it's all because of Him. Man, why should we talk to others about Jesus? Because without Him, I would be lost. But with Him, there's hope, there's joy, there's freedom. We inherit a whole family. Don't I want the same thing for the people in my life? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul says, There is now, if you're in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He says, And now, because of God, we are reconciled to Christ, and we're a part of a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciled beings helping others be reconciled as well. Isn't that amazing? That's what our mission is. We see that in the scriptures. Why should I talk about Jesus? Because without him, I would be lost. Never forget that because of him, your life is better. And if you truly believe that, share it. Now, here's the thing. I, I just wanted to say something real quick. <laughs> I didn't say this in the beginning. Those little pieces of paper I, got, I gave you, those weren't to put like the sermon outline on. I should have said that from the beginning. But go ahead and keep those. Those are for later on afterwards. If you are writing the sermon outline on that, that's awesome. Okay. So if you want to, you can flip it on the back and write down what I'm going to show you at the end. Um, as we go ahead and move into our second point, why should I also talk about Jesus? Because his love is light in darkness. Let me tell you something. It doesn't take too long to scroll through social media. To talk to people that have heard the news recently, to talk to people online, to check your phone, maybe check in like Snapchat or things like that, and see how dark this world has become, right? And I'm not just saying, oh man, this world is, is getting worse and worse and worse. No, the world's been dark since man fell. It has been. But it's just so crazy how now with the advent of social media, we see it even more. What was it just yesterday, was it not? Or was it today? I think there was a shooting in Odessa. I didn't find that out until going online this afternoon and seeing that, and it just blew my mind. Just another one. We live in a world that is so dark, that is in need of the light of God. Man, this is a problem that's been going on since Adam and Eve, right? In Genesis chapter three, we see in Genesis chapter three, we see the fall of man. 
And you would think that those two individuals, right, I'm sure in their minds, they were like, okay, Eve, we can't let this happen again. Adam, I got you. We're going to raise our kids, and they're going to follow God all the days of their life. You go to chapter 4, what happens? One of their children slays the other. Jump a few chapters later in chapter 6, a couple generations later, and evil has grown so much that we read that in Genesis chapter 6, Moses pens, I wonder, I wonder how sorrowful he felt writing that that there was a time where evil was on the hearts of men continually. But then you got Noah, right, and his family. And though they weren't perfect, they were those who stood righteous before the rest of the world, and they were saved, and yet even they struggled with sin, and then their descendants would struggle with sin. You jump to chapter 12, and then you see mankind as a whole. You would think a flood would cause people to say, man, we got to stop sinning, right? we got to do better. You jump to chapter 12, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to build a tower that's going to help them be equal with God and with heaven presumptuousness. I don't have to tell you the rest of the Bible, right? I don't have to go through all the rest of the times that man falls in the Bible. And it's not to pick on us as humanity, but it's for us to realize, man, this world is filled with darkness. But then you jump to John chapter 1, one of my favorite verses, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. You go to the New Testament and you see hope. And in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And it's talking about Jesus, okay? In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness couldn't comprehend it. Now that idea in the King James, and I also believe in the New King James, the darkness couldn't comprehend it. That doesn't mean the darkness is like, wait, what is this light? No, it means the darkness couldn't quench it. It couldn't burn out that light. That's how strong Jesus' love is, praise God, right? Because this world is in desperate need of that. You've got this amazing light that radiated to humanity that we read of. He came to this earth to do so. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God has demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The light himself died for us. Jesus, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, there are several I am's in the book of John. But in John chapter 8 and verse 12, one of those, he says, I am the light and anyone who follows after me will no longer walk in darkness. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, this is how Paul describes the world outside of Christ. He says that those in the world are darkened in understanding and alienated from God. So what can help a people that are darkened in their understanding and alienated from God? The light. When I was a kid, I remember I was maybe about like, I want to say third grade. I can't remember, but I remember it was, it was, it was a real long time ago, third grade. Um, and I remember that uh, we went to this children's science museum. And I remember in that science museum, we had to crawl through this dark tunnel that there was really, it was like, there was like no sound and there was like no, you know, there was, it was just pitch dark and try to find our way out of the tunnel. It's kind of trippy for, <laughs> no joke. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of scary for like a, for an eight year old. I remember crawling through it. And then once you stepped out and you got into the light, oh man, that light was bright. It kind of burned a little bit. But then you realized how much better it was being in the light than it was in the dark. You get so used to the dark that it becomes all that you can understand. You get so used to the dark that, you know, we read of those, you know, you know blind, leading the blind, and so on and so forth. The reason why is because people just get so used to living in darkness, they don't know anything else. This world, man, the more secularism continues to grow in our country, the more and more people are darkened in their minds. It's not just secularism, it's just sin. It's not just secularism, I mean, it's denominationalism, it's anything you could think of that encapsulates everything outside of Christ. We have the light, right? If you're in Jesus, I mean, we sing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Teach that to little kids. Do we let it shine? Do we let it radiate? Because Jesus says, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8. But you know what else he says? Who else does he call the light of the world? Does he call just preachers the light of the world? Preachers by profession, elders, deacons? No, he says, my disciples, you are the light of the world of the world. Let me tell you, the world is a hurting place and in desperate need of people to show them that there is something better. Could you imagine what change a, could a young person experience who's contemplated orchestrating a mass shooting if they truly came to know that there was a God in heaven who loves them immensely? I don't know the hurt that a lot of these people are experiencing that caused them to do evil things. I don't know the hurt that a lot of people are experiencing that causes them to be so confused about maybe their identities. But I know that there's a God in heaven who loves them immensely, right? 
There's a God in heaven, and they need to know that. I'm telling you, man, I, I sat in a study at Polishing the Pulpit of a young man who was an atheist. I, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, it was an atheist who had come out of atheism, and he just talked about how, I mean, you know, he, yeah, he didn't believe in the God of the Bible, but you know, now that he does, and now that he believes in the truth, just how he realizes even more and more how hopeless he was and how lost he was. I mean, he only chose atheism because, well, it just, without hope, it just makes sense. Without there being a God, I mean, what else would there be, right? And yet he realized that lifestyle doesn't produce love. It doesn't produce true hope for anything. Thanks be to God that he's a Christian and he's helping many other people who struggled with the same thing that he did. When we think about the world, man, like I said earlier, the world is a hurting place in desperate need of people to show them that there is light, there is hope. Christ is the beacon of hope. He's the beacon of light that a world alienated in darkness needs. Now, here's the thing. Once again, we're called to be the light, right? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. If we're those who walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, then we have fellowship with him. So those who are walking in the light as he is in the light, we're those who are radiating light. How do we continue to stay in that light? The psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 105 tells us how. He says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You don't want to be alienated by this world because it could happen to us. There are plenty of Christians who are becoming darkened in their understanding and are not a benefit to anyone. The blind can't lead the blind, right? That's not what, that's not, that's not biblical. Let me tell you, this is what illuminates our life. This is what shows hope. We've got to share it with people in our lives. Like I said, there are many people in this world, if you told them and showed them there is somebody great who loves you, that's what they need. That's what they need. And that's what Jesus came to do. Thirdly, another reason why we should be talking about Jesus is because ultimately he has commanded us. He's commanded you and he's commanded me. There has never been a task more serious than obeying God and teaching others the gospel. Jesus commanded it, right? Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 through 20. What does Jesus there say to his disciples? He says, go therefore into some nations, just stay in Jerusalem, just stay in Judea, just stay amongst the holy people. No, he says, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That was Matthew who wrote that. Matthew was a follower of Jesus. He was one of the 12, right? Levi. He was one of the 12. Mark wrote the other account of the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And he must have learned it from his, his uh, the, one that, the one that he learned from as well. Peter, in Mark chapter 16, and verse 15 and 16, Mark pens, he says, Go therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Both accounts are said to be recorded by, or excuse me, both accounts are recorded to be said by Jesus, right? They're both inspired. They're both Jesus' words. Saying what? Is it merely suggesting? Hey, if you happen to find time in your life to talk to somebody about the gospel, yeah, you might as well do it. Or do you think he's telling them? That idea of go, you know what that means? In your manner of life, everywhere you go, whether it's, uh, you got to think about that. You think the apostles truly embodied that aspect? That's what that word go means. That doesn't just mean get in your car and go find people that may have a heart to hear. No, it says everywhere you go, teach the gospel. A lot of times we wait for people to come to us, right? A lot of times we're like, Lord, I pray that somebody asks me about Jesus today. Well, how can they learn about Jesus unless someone tell them? Isn't that what the eunuch said to Philip? How can I learn about this unless someone teach me? We've got to have our eyes peeled open because this is a command that we be teaching the lost. When we look at the scriptures, we see that the early church, I mean, they obeyed this, right? They didn't just see Jesus' words as mere commandment. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, right? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. You remember how this morning we correlated that with the Lord's Supper? We said Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew chapter 26. Therefore, that he told his disciples to continue to teach people this. They taught them that. You saw that evidently throughout the New Testament. What about evangelism? Jesus taught his disciples evangelism, right? He demonstrated evangelism. You don't think that was a part of the apostles' doctrine as well that they continued in? That they learned? I mean, evidently, you look at the end of the chapter, right? That they found favor with men and God, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved. Man, 
They were being evangelistic. As a matter of fact, you jump to Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, we find Peter and John on trial before the Sanhedrin. They're told not to preach the name of God anymore. They're told not to preach the name of Christ, rather, anymore. You know what Peter and John say to them? We can't not but talk about the things in which we've seen or heard. How can we not share the only cure for the biggest problem of humanity? We've been trying since the prophets. We've been trying to figure out what is the cure for the heart, for the sin situation. And we found it. And his name is Jesus. How could we not talk about this? The church faced adversity, did they not? The early church did. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, what do we find the church doing? Well, we find Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he's breathing out slaughters, as some translations put it. In other words, he's making threats. He's ripping apart the church. He's trying everything he can to break these people. This is before he became a Christian. Man, he became one of the strongest individuals to help bind the people together, right? Prior to that, he hated Christianity and tried everything he could to decimate the name of Christ. And we read in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, that the church, because of that, they were scattered. The church there in Judea, Jerusalem, they were scattered abroad. They went all over the place because of the persecution. But then you jump down to verse 4. It says, but everywhere they went, they did what? They stopped talking about Jesus because they didn't want the same thing happening where they were at. No, it says, everywhere they went, they went preaching the gospel. Everywhere they went. Oh, man. When we look at that, when we see what they were doing, does it seem like the early church just saw Jesus' commands as just mere suggestion? Or did they see it as truth? Did they see it as doctrine? Did they see it as command? I talked about Acts chapter, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 a little bit this morning, briefly as a quote. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 11, rather, also in verse 12, it says that there are some that he gave to be apostles and prophets, and some he gave to be preachers as well, or rather evangelists and elders and, and teachers and so on and so forth. He said, and the reason why, in verse 12, is to equip the saints to do what? To do ministry. In other words, the role of evangelism is not just for a few in the congregation. The role of evangelism is not just for a few in the brotherhood, but it is every single soul in the body of Christ. It's every single soul's responsibility to be going forth and talking about Jesus. How can you not talk about something that's so amazing that you've experienced? We look at scripture, some more scriptures to help us understand this idea. In Romans, we talked about this on Wednesday night. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul says, I am in debt to both Greek as well as to barbarian. I am in debt to the unwise as well as to the wise. And when we thought about that on Wednesday night, when we talked about that, it made us look a little bit inwardly. Do I see myself as one who is in debt to the souls around me? And I want to show them the gospel. I need to show them the gospel. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16 says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. But woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You think Paul himself, one who at one point, remember in Acts chapter 8 we said was trying to divide the church, when he became a Christian, he didn't become a backseat member of the church. You know what I mean? But I'm not talking about people who are saying <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he didn't become a per he didn't become a person who's like, well, you know, I'm gonna let everybody else do the work. I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna hang out back here. No, man, Paul became a Christian, the very the individual that hated the name of Christ. When he became a Christian, he said, I want to proclaim it every single day. I want to talk to people about it. He was so enthusiastic. He was excited. Even when he was in prison, he was talking to people about Jesus. And there were souls won even then. You remember Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, what are they doing? They're in jail, right? They're in jail for preaching the name of Jesus. But what do they do while they're in jail? They're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs because we preach the gospel when we sing. You realize that, right? Uh, some of the songs that Cody uh, presented tonight. Can you not learn the gospel from those songs, Cody? You can, right? That's why we sing these songs. We sing in spirit and in truth. We teach even through song. And it encourages us as well as we look at the example of Paul and when we sing songs like that to be evangelistic. You remember, the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved, right? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul say, you know, you believe that's all you needed to do. Or did he really teach him the gospel? Did Paul say, I don't really want to get in conflict about this right now. Because a lot of crazy things have just happened all around us. No, Paul saw it as an opportunity 
I want to help this man. And let me tell you, I talked about, I preached a sermon about him last summer about the jailer. Let me tell you, the role of a jailer wasn't just like, we get this, in, we get this, it, we get this image of like a cartoon sheriff sleeping and he's snoring and he's got a key hung, hanging right here and you know, Paul and Silas are in jail. That's not the image. They were also torturers. They were individuals who brutalized the prisoners that were in there. They were individuals who were skilled in war and oftentimes ret- retired uh, retirees from uh, the army who would say, okay, you guys have done your service. You've done a lot of damage to the enemy. We're going to help you. We're going we're to let you retire this way. You're going you're gonna to serve the, uh, the emperor in prison. You're going to serve the emperor as a, as a guard or as a jailer. This is the man that they wanted to teach the gospel to. They saw the opportunity to share Jesus with because they knew it was a command that was given to them. Now, I want to look at several other things as we look at this idea of he's commanded us to do this. Is talking about the gospel the right thing to do? Is it? Absolutely. If you have your Bibles, I want us to look at James chapter 4 and verse 17. We've been looking at the book of James. Gerald's been doing an awesome job. I called him Brother James this morning because, man, he knows the book of James. But Brother Gerald went through the book of James, and we haven't gotten to chapter 4 yet, but I want to go ahead and read James chapter 4 and verse 17. And now, of course, you know, but he's talking about here, you know, boasting about tomorrow and presumptuous living. But even then, this, this still applies. What does he say here? He says, so whoever knows to do the right thing to do and fails to do it for him. He, what he means by fails to do it is not that you've tried it and you don't have a whole lot. He's saying that you don't do it at all. He's saying for him who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is what? It is sin. Is teaching the gospel the right thing to do? So for him who knows to do the right thing and to not do it, then what is it? It's sin. We've got to be honest about that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 says this. If, now here's the thing. Knowing that now, if we continue in that pattern of saying, you know what though? I don't want to evangelize. Or you know what though? I don't need to evangelize. That's somebody else's job. Knowing that now, then is that sinning deliberately? Because Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 says, for if you continue to sin deliberately, you face the judgment. We gotta understand evangelism is a command. We gotta understand that evangelism, this isn't some suggestion, it is an imperative statement when our Lord and Savior says, go into all the world. Here's the thing, I'm not telling you that, man, everybody is going to listen to you every single time. I'm a preacher, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know if every single person always listens to me. I don't know if every single door knocking campaign Cody has been on, I don't know if every single person was like, yeah, I wanna talk about Jesus. You know what I mean? I know I can, I can share from my own personal experiences. I've had people who said no. But let me tell you, you know, we went door knocking yesterday. That was awesome. And I'm so encouraged by the congregation uh, for what we did yesterday. There are people who said no, but there are people that no may not be their answer later on. If the Lord allows. There are people who may say no now. That brochure we gave them, it may be sitting in their drawer somewhere, and then someday they're looking for answers. And they're probably going to pull it out and want to know more seen it happen. I've been on door knocking campaigns when I was in school. We didn't find out that somebody that we, we knocked doors. It wasn't somebody I, I door knocked, like I knocked on their door. It was another student who did that. And he had spent, you know, he had spent some time, you know, he was frustrated about like, man, you know, like, I, I, you know, I thought I made a breakthrough. About three months later, we found out that that gentleman became a Christian. Three months, I don't know what, what happened within those three months, but something clicked. That's why we got to be doing what we're called to do. Because you just never know who's going to say, I want to obey Jesus. I was thinking, I was driving in traffic, I was driving in, uh, here on Randall the other day, and I was thinking about just how I needed to be more evangelistic. And I was thinking, I wonder how many souls here in Elgin would obey. I said, I wouldn't know that unless I actually go try it, right? Unless I actually go talk to them. I wouldn't know the kind of people that, that I'm going to be reaching unless I actually go sit down and talk with people or talk about Jesus, or share the love of Christ with them, or demonstrate Christ. Preaching the gospel doesn't just mean by what you say, but also showing it and demonstrating in your actions as well. When we think about this, it is a command. We should talk about Jesus because without him we would be lost, because his love is light and darkness, because he's commanded us. But finally, and this kind of wraps back to the very beginning, we should talk about Jesus because without him, those in our life are lost. Just like the way without him we would be lost, without him, the people in our life, if they don't have Jesus, they are lost. And we've got to be honest with that. You know what I mean? We can't make excuses where God doesn't make excuses. 
We can't say, well, you know, maybe there's... No, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Does that sound like there may be some who are exempt from that? No, he says, no one comes to the Father but by me. I'm not saying this in anger. I'm not saying this in hate at all. I want you to understand that we're saying this because we want people to obey. Paul, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 7 through 9, says this. He says, the Lord shall come again, which is awesome for us, right? Because that's what we're looking forward to. But this passage, Paul says, the Lord shall come again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and them who obey not the gospel. That's not comforting to people who are outside of Christ. And we've got to be honest with that. If we try to skirt from that, if we try to hide from that, if we try to, I mean, honestly, that's not teaching the truth. I'm not saying that's like the first thing that you're going to, hey, you know, you're going to hell today. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we've got to be honest with the people in our, we've got to be honest about the people in our lives. If they're lost, they're lost and we need to be reaching them. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? You understand what the Bible is teaching? Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he even says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done many wonderful works? And this is not the words of Paul Delgado. This is the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, and I will say to them saying, depart from me. I never knew you. You that work iniquity. I'm not the one turning them away. But on that day of judgment, it's going to be Jesus. Romans chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at Romans chapter 10. I want to read what Paul has to say here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 through 10. This is a verse, one of those verses, Cody, right? This is one of those verses that we oftentimes cite in preaching school, right? That they remind us why we're doing what we do. And in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, we're going to go ahead and start there. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. In other words, the gospel is for everyone. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. You want to put, if you want to put a little footnote there in your Bible, you can look at Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, where Ananias describes what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone doing what? Preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, I quoted this morning, uh, Paul writing to Timothy reminds him, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, that is the man Christ Jesus. If there is only one mediator between God and men, we need to be teaching people about that one way, right? We need to be teaching people about Jesus. Let me ask you a question. When is there ever a right time to tell someone they're lost? Is there ever really a right time? When is there a wrong way? Well, excuse me, there, there could be a wrong way of doing it, right? There could be a wrong way of telling somebody they're lost. You could do it callously. You could do it like you don't really care. Nay, you're going to hell anyway. And that's not the way we're called to do it. But is there ever really a right time to tell someone, man, you're in need of Jesus? A lot of times we say, well, no, 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 now's, now's not the right time. Let me tell you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, today's the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week. And I understand we've got to be patient with people, right? We got to be patient with people, got to be understanding. There's some people who are going through some things that we got to learn and understand who they are first and share the gospel with them. But is there ever really a wrong time to help a lost soul? And likewise, is there ever a wrong time to tell people there's a God in heaven who loves you immensely? Is there ever a wrong time to do that? I even know some people, myself included, who it's like, you know, it's, you know I had a friend when I was at Freed who he would, uh, you know, I've, I've described him to Cody as this one guy who, man, he would roll down his car window. If he saw people he didn't know, he'd tell them, Jesus loves you. <laughs> this is really, and he was sincere about it, man. If you ever met this guy, uh, he is by far one of the most sincere believers I've ever met and loves the gospel and loves souls. He didn't grow up in the church. He was lost himself. And when he came in contact with the blood of Jesus and rose in newness of life, he couldn't help but to share it with people. He couldn't help it. There was never, he never saw like, nah, maybe it's not an appropriate time to tell people that there's a God in heaven who loves them. Never saw it that way. Because he recognized, man, there's a lot of people, you don't know what's going on in their life right now, but by telling them that there's a God in heaven who loves you immensely and wants you to be with him, that's what they need to hear. 
And honestly, if they're lost, that is exactly what they need to know. I gave you all the piece of paper. I say I gave you. I, I, I didn't do that. I, 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 I want to thank Mark and Debbie for handing those out. I gave you a piece of paper, or rather, I gave them to give you a piece of paper. I asked them to hand out these papers to each of you tonight with the purpose of this. I want you to take some time tonight to think of five people in your life that are in need of the gospel that you so desperately want to call your brother and sister. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not saying make a list of all the people that are lost and throw it away. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying go make a list of people that you want to see saved. Make a list of people that you're like, man, I want to see that. And here's the thing. The reason why I'm doing this is because I know we could all think of more than five people, right? I know we could all think of uh, more. I know we could all think of one person in our lives that we wish would come to Christ. Man, I could think of more than five people at jobs I've held. I could think of more than five people in my family. I could think of more than five people at congregations I've worked at. I could think of more than five people in my group of friends growing up. You get what I'm saying? We gotta really think about people. We gotta look at things from the perspective that now we have as new creation. People are either lost or saved, and where would we wanna see people? We wanna see them saved. So I'm encouraging, write down some names right now or tonight. Pray about it and, and see, well, how can I reach these people? Because I believe every single one of us can do that. Now, unless you've either been honestly, and we've got to think about this, unless I've been living under a rock or I truly don't understand what the gospel is all about, I need to realize and I need to be honest that there are people who are lost in my life. And I want you to understand something. This is not a sermon of condemnation. This is not a sermon of telling you, oh man, you guys are the worst evangelists. Now let me tell you something. Like I said, I have been nothing but encouraged by this congregation. I've been here two years. I don't think I've ever worked with a more loving group of Christians than here at, congregation, at this congregation here at Westside. I know Cody can say the same thing. I know my wife can say the same thing. We talk about it a lot. I'm immensely, I'm encouraged to be more evangelistic because of the brothers, sisters at this congregation. What my goal is to encourage you back and to encourage us all as a congregation. Let's do this together. See, I got to witness something awesome yesterday. I got to witness my fellow brothers and sisters going out through this community. It was a short time that we did it, and we just did it behind here. But man, I know sometimes some people think that there's not an impact in that. But we got, I think we printed out, what, about 200 of those flyers, Cody? I don't know how many we handed out total. I wish we would have. That would have been kind of cool to see how many we handed out, right? But you know, next time, right? We'll do that. But I think about how many we did hand out and how many, if we would have handed out uh, 200, do you know how many people have learned that there's a congregation here who loves them? 200 homes in two hours. How many people have I talked to today that Jesus loves them? You can do that because you've got a Savior that loves you immensely as well. If you're here this evening, and if there's anything we can encourage you to do, if there's anything that we can encourage, one thing being evangelism, if we can encourage you, though, to follow the gospel yourself, if you haven't done that, man, just like looking at all these verses that we saw, the reason why I'm preaching this sermon tonight is because there are people that are lost. Do not leave this building tonight lost, because we want you to be a part of the family as well. If there's anything that we can do for you this evening, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and as we sing.